Okay, so uh, before we get into the nitty gritty and, and start talking about repairs, I just I just really want to give you a little walk around the keyboard itself, at least for those who who aren't that familiar with it. Uh, so it's got 68 keys. We've got a speaker there, which is got a lead plugged in to it, or soldered onto it, I should say, and that plugs into the main board on the BBC. Uh, so that's your sound for there. This is an 8 ohm speaker, and it's half a watt worth of power in it. Keyboard plugs into the motherboard with a 17 pin connection along there. On the left hand side of the board, we've got some small holes. I don't know if you can see those. So these were originally there for uh, speech, basically, uh, but that was never really implemented. Uh, you know, additional additional uh, facilities for speech. Now, third-party vendors actually added some kits in to their repertoire and give you the ability to take the plastic serrated cover off the keyboard surround and add in a sort of pluggable ROM thing for sideways ROM. So that's what that's for. Not really used hardly at all these days uh, there's no there's no need for it really right hand side of the keyboard if you can see that there's a socket that socket there is not supposed to be there what is supposed to be there if there is anything there is just an 8 pin dip switch and that allows you to and that that does work today that's that allows you to choose your start up resolution option for example or the type of filing system that you want to use whether it's uh, uh, DFS or the NFS, the network filing system. Yeah, so that's either Econet or, or DFS basically on there. And uh, there's a couple of other options I think for uh, is it drive speed maybe? I can't remember. But yeah, there's some other options on there. Of course, nobody really uses those either. Not as far as I know. They might do. They might use some of them. There's not really much else on the board. So you've got some diodes down there. You've got some some resistors here, a few capacitors, disk capacitors here, uh, an electrolytic smoothing capacitor to there. Got three LEDs. This one illuminates uh, when the cassette motor is running. This one is the caps lock, and this one is the shift lock. And then on the back of the board, it's just really a normal printed circuit board. Um, we can see here some of the because these have never been used really they've oxidized uh, a little bit but it's not too bad so if if it was ever a requirement to use those you can always touch those up with a fiber brush fiber tip brush and you know put some flux on it and then solder it so it's always good to have a visual inspection of the board on the back Acon computers limited it's difficult to get it focus on that version 2 so there's two sorts of keyboard you're likely to encounter this is the most common one okay so let's take a look at the kind of problems that may occur and as you might guess the first most common thing that will fail is the key switch itself okay so let me see if I can find a key switch to show you that I've got in my drawer so this is one of the key switches that will uh, fit in the BBC quite a simple sort of affair mechanical key there's two uh, leaves in there, two contact leaves, and then you've got a couple of pins underneath there. So this will happen normally, actually, when you've, you know, when you've you've got hold of a BBC and it's been in the attic for 20 years and hasn't been used. Tarnish builds up on these pins in here. Uh, but what a lot of people do is give you advice um, to actually squirt WD-40 down these keys. My advice: do not do that. Every time. Every, every time I've seen that done, it's ended up with a, a mush inside the inside the keycap and all over the board, and uh, it kind of mixes with the dust and rubbish that's inside there, and makes it harder to press the key down. It's it's not a nice light up and down movement anymore, and it generally doesn't fix the problem either. Usually, that is, in my opinion, harmful. Uh, my advice is do not do that. Uh, what you need to do is to disassemble this. Now you don't have to disassemble it completely. I'll actually take the pins out 
see these little pins you just get some long nose pliers and grab it and twist it and you see this is coming out now I'll show you this under a microscope in a minute but for now um, you could actually see the tarnish on here if I can get it up close enough to the mic uh, the, to the camera no you can't see it, I can't get it in focus at the moment but basically you can see the black on that and that's not good okay that is not good so that's what we need to do we need to clean that off now I haven't actually tested this key so I'm gonna test it now it might be alright I don't know generally cleaning that tarnish off is what we need to do so so I'll put it back in I should have tested it before really yeah and these are quite tight they're quite they're quite tight to get in so I'm going to turn my meter on take this out of the way and we'll have a look at that key stick it on ohms we'll find out how many ohms we've got find out if we've got an ohm to go to as they say who says that I don't know well that's pretty good we've got uh, just under an ohm that is pretty good half an ohm now if I put the leads together I've got uh, about point, point 0.2 so there's about yeah about point, point 0.3 point 0.3 of an ohm in the contacts there and I'm wondering if we can actually get that bit a bit better so that's what I want to do I'm going to take these out and I'm going to clean the tarnish off them okay so now we've got the pins out uh, what I want to do is clean those pins with the back end of a scalpel in other words not the blade part but the top of the scalpel so that's what I'm going to do now so uh, I'm going to now use that to clean the pins so we just see the lid here for a little while and after I've done that I'm going to uh, put them back in and assemble the switch so there we go right uh, let's see if we can get these pins back in and uh, once we've done that um, and reassembled it all oh, then we'll try and see what the reading is on the pins see if it's improved any more than what it was before put my own meter there and uh, I'll do a relative okay now let's see what it what it goes down to look at that I've got virtually zero ohms so you can see there's a big difference in the meter reading uh, admittedly that's point point two less right so um, yeah so you can see that there's it's it's made a, a measured difference and normally when they don't work it's worse than that it's it's either no contact hardly any contact at all or many ohms and that that will work now as a key switch that will work fine so I can show you how to how to get the uh, the key switches out which is what I'm going to do now all right all right so a soldered irons on uh, ready to take out a key so what I'm going to do is so I'll take out something in the middle uh, that would otherwise be hard to get out so I'm going to take out the K key well, why not so let me just locate that so that's going to be the second row up in line with the K so this is the one we want to get out okay okay we're taking out the K that was unintended so these these pads on here are or can be very fragile so be careful when you take this out don't put a lot of force on um, it should the solder should come out fairly easily because the holes are fairly large so once that's once that's uh, mainly desoldered just put a little bit of a little bit of pressure on see if you can move the keys a little bit sorry not the keys the pins right 
I'm hoping that that will be all right now. If you're taking one of these out on the edges, then it's going to be fairly easy. You can get a screwdriver and carefully prise it up either side of the switch. Um, but well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to use a key puller. So all a key puller is, if you haven't seen one before, is basically two bits of wire. And it sits either side of the key. So we need to take the key cap off. Uh, eBay or even probably Amazon or one of these other places for about two or three quid. They're pretty cheap. Um, so I just bought one. But you could make, if you're really stuck, you could use some string bound up and wrap it around a pencil. I've done that before and that works. So just spread that over the key and gently pull up and out it comes. So there you go. That's okay. Okay. All right. And inside here, there are two little tabs, which you saw on the other key. Uh, these these tabs basically, uh, you know, stop it coming out. That is the idea. So if you just, so I'll try and squeeze these little tabs in there, and then get in the side of these. And here it comes. Here it comes. So that wasn't too painful, was it? Really? It's quite easy. So let's have a look at how good this is. Go back to my ohms. Go back to take a relative meeting. A meeting? A relative meter reading. So it's between point 0.1 and point 0.2. So we go relative, not relative. Okay. So zero. Let's see what we get. Yeah, this is what happens when you haven't got enough hands available. That's interesting. Look at that. It's three ohms. Two ohms. It's getting a bit better, but it's still still a lot higher. So let's take this apart and have a look at that. And see what that one's look like looks like. So we'll quickly take that apart. And again, uh, we've got tarnish. Alright, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get this under a microscope so we can take a better look and see if that helps. Yeah, well as you can see, it's pretty, pretty tarnished there. So let's start to clean this up with the, the knife. So uh, it's time to put the switch back in now that it's been repaired. Well, it wasn't really that faulty because it came out of a working keyboard, but it was really just to show you the process with the other one and then to demonstrate how to get a key out and do the same process again. So we've seen that. I have to say that you know something as low as that in terms of resistance is not going to cause a problem uh, but this was to just prove a point that even with a, a one that's working you can still see that tarnish builds up. if it's not working it's going to be far greater than that uh, and it's going to be very obvious in terms of the corrosion that's on there tarnish comes from things like oxygen sulfur stuff like that um, so i guess if you're the person who would have been lighting up a lot of cigarettes back in the day uh, with matches um, or I guess there's sulfur in that, not really sure. Um, anyway, it is what it is. So let's get this back in into the hole and uh, take it from there. So it should just hopefully pop back in. And there it is. Easy as that, eh? Really, really easy. So let's solder it back in, give it a clean, and get the keycaps on. Very easy, really. Let's give this little squirt. I always seem to use far more isopropyl alcohol than I need. I need one of those sprayer things. I see people using it on YouTube, but I haven't been able to find something small enough that's readily available for me to to wash it out and use it. But I will at one point. Well, at some point. Okay, uh, that's the key back in there. And it's JKL we want to put in there, J. 
Okay. And L. So we know the key key is working. So that's not a problem. Next thing for us to do is to take a look at the circuit diagram in a little bit bit more detail. So this is the schematic of keyboard and here we have PL1 which is a 17 pin connector. Uh, and all these lines, or most of these lines that are coming in or out of it, are to do with the versatile interface adapter, which is basically an I.O. chip that sits on the motherboard, uh, with the exception of a few pins. So let's cover the exceptions. The exceptions are a 1 MHz clock, which is coming in here, a keyboard enabled signal, uh, also you've got 0 and 5 volts. Uh, the only other one is this reset key. So let's deal with the simplest things first. So that's a ground connection there, and that goes to the reset pin on the reset circuitry on the motherboard. So when you press that, you'll get in a reset, and that is a soft reset, not a power on reset. And then you've got the LEDs for the cassette motor, the caps lock and the shift lock. So they're just simply tied up to 5 volts here. And then we have uh, 470 ohm resistors, and when these are pulled down to ground, by the motherboard, uh, then it obviously will illuminate through this current limiting resistor. On the power supplied side of it, we've got three ceramic disc capacitors for filtering high, high frequencies, we're switching, and this smoothing cap here. So that's just the 22 microfarad. Okay, so I drew this schematic a couple of days ago. Yeah, it just took ages to get it right. Uh, we've got a matrix in the middle with all our keys. They're all pulled, all these lines here are pulled up to 5 volt by these resistors. And then we've got a an 8 input NAND gate there. So that will sense a key being pressed. And that signal will go out on CA2 and interrupt the processor. And this will come back and it will scan these lines. Then IC2 will, will be instructed to scan uh, horizontally and we'll find out which one was causing the signal to have been pressed. Now, the only reason I'm really showing you this is because if you get uh, a number of keys not working and then you test your key and you find they're still not working, then clearly there's something else wrong. I've never seen one of these chips yet fail. Not to say that they can't, but I've not seen one fail. The one that always comes up is a break in the track. So that's what you're going to see. You're going to see um, a break, basically, in one of the one of these tracks in the vertical there. Say, and you you've got perhaps a, an F2 or a space, but you haven't got everything else, and that's because it's broken between there and the rest of them. You need to look really well. You can trace this through anyway by continuity, follow the track around because they they all link to each other, uh, and if you just Go to subsequent sections of it, you'll find where the break is. So I will add a link in the down below section, the information section, to this document on the GitHub. So it knows what it's put out, it knows what it's scanning, and it knows what output it's got, and that's how it can tell what was pressed. Well, I hope you found the information in this video useful and interesting. And if you did, please leave a like and hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber already. And I will see you next time. Mr. Sexy Smile